Well, it is a blessing to be assembled together today. Grateful for each person here. We, we have guests among us, some that we know and some we hope to know soon. And we hope everybody feels welcome and a part of this assembly. Uh, reflecting on it a little bit, you know, we've got people in the assembly that have been Christians for many, many decades. We've got people in the assembly that have been Christians for a week. We've got people that we hope will soon make their commitment to the Lord and obey the gospel. We can all worship the Lord together. What a blessing that is. And we hope you feel that this morning. We have quite the text to deal with today in our continuing study of the New Testament letter of Jude. Jude is that little one chapter book that is tucked between the more famous letters of the Apostle John and the book of Revelation, which closes the New Testament. We're looking this morning at the large central section of the letter, verses 5 through 23. I hope you've been reading through Jude each week. I I suggested you do so as we work through this brief series. And this section in particular is one that needs a lot of reading and investigation. There's uh, too much in this section, of course, to cover it in great detail. Just in this message this morning, my goal is to, to give you a brief outline of what's here and to set these verses in the context of Jude and to focus on the application, of course, that Jude gives to all of this at the very end of the passage this morning. Now, in the sermon handout today, if you don't know, we do have a handout most weeks. Um, they're, they're printed and in the back. It's a little bit different than normal. Um, usually, this is filled with different fill-in-the-blanks or questions for you to answer if that helps you follow along each week. But today there's some additional information uh, about these verses in Jude that, that we might not have time to cover in the lesson this morning, some additional detail. And so I hope it will, um, will, will help you fill in some of the blanks in your understanding of the letter. So let's remind ourselves first what Jude is trying to do. And then we'll look more specifically at this particular section. Jude opens the letter describing himself as a humble servant of Jesus Christ. He says he had wanted to write the church a letter discussing their common salvation in Jesus. But circumstances had forced him to write a different kind of a letter. A letter that would encourage them to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. They had a a faith, a a set of beliefs, a doctrine from God that was worth standing up for and was worth defending. And they needed to do that boldly. And um, they, they needed to do that in a faithful way. And so he calls on them to do so. Apparently there are some troublemakers in the church that he's writing to. Jude reveals this. They are false teachers. And Jude intends to confront them and to deal with them. And he wants the members of the church to be aware of them and to do the same, to sort of follow his lead in this. So now to look at the confrontation in in our passage this morning, what a confrontation it is. You know, Jude's, again, a brief letter, so brief that you might think you could almost read it in one breath, but if you've been reading it, you probably found it takes more than one breath to read Jude. Uh, Jude is a mouthful in a lot of ways, and, and he writes in these long sentences and sort of has phrase after colorful phrase that drives home his basic point, which is this. The people that are troubling the church in Jude's day are false teachers, yes, but more than that, they are most of all false livers, to coin a phrase. You know, Jude barely mentions the nature 
of what these troublemakers are teaching. He doesn't tell us what they're teaching. Instead, he focuses almost exclusively on how they live, how they behave themselves. It's primarily in the way they live that one can tell that they're false. That's uh, an interesting idea, isn't it? And and powerful. Uh, Jude reminds us that false teaching is really false living. And by its very nature, false living is false teaching. Now, why is that? Because of the very nature of faith in God and in Jesus. You see, God's truth, gospel truth, leads people to live a certain way. It leads them to live godly lives. Being filled with the Spirit of God transforms the way that people live and behave. Being a true Christian influences morality. And what Jude observes in the lives of these troublemakers included none of that. So Jude uses some very strong, some very direct language to describe these people that he is confronting. And I'll just quickly remind you of some of the ways in this section that Jude refers to the false teachers. He says, for instance, that they defile the flesh. They reject authority. He says that they blaspheme holy things. He says that they are destroyed. He pronounces a woe upon them. He calls them blemishes on the church. He says they're empty people. They're lightweights. They're fruitless. He says they are twice dead, shameful, rootless, and wandering. He says they are ungodly. They are harsh people. They're grumblers. They're malcontents. They're big-mouthed braggarts. They play favorites to get ahead. He says they're scoffers. They're full of ungodly passions. They are worldly. And they divide people. And if that were not enough, he clinches it all by making the last way he describes them the fact that they do not even have the Holy Spirit within them. Now, folks, if one does not have the Spirit, one is not a Christian. When you become a Christian, you are promised forgiveness of sins based on the shed blood of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 38, among other passages. Jude says these people didn't have the Spirit. They they were not of God, at least not anymore. Now those are pretty serious charges, are they not? Jude doesn't mix words. He doesn't pull punches. He is not politically correct in any way. In fact, quite the opposite. Jude tells it like it is. These people that that Jude was worried about were were not outsiders. We need to understand that. They're right there in the midst of the church. They claim to be Christians even though they're not. They appeared in one sense to be spiritual people, but when you looked at their lives, it showed otherwise. And that's really the biggest issue here Um, when you boil it all down, they were false livers. They claimed allegiance to a holy God, yet they lived immoral lives. They prayed in the name of a sinless Savior, and yet they indulged every sinful fleshly desire that they wished to indulge. They assumed that they had the Spirit of God within, yet there was no evidence 
of the fruit of that spirit in them. Instead, they're full of wickedness and lust and ungodliness. So let's just take a further moment and outline how Jude addresses us here in these 19 verses. It begins in verse 5 by calling to memory three biblical examples of ungodliness. Listen to how he does so, beginning in verse 5. He, he writes, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So he, he makes reference to the grumbling Israelites in the wilderness. And then he refers to rebellious angels and also to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the emphasis in all three cases is, is what happened to them when they rebelled against God and when they sinned. They were clearly judged and punished. There was no mistaking the fact that God held them to a standard and expected them to meet it. And when they did not, they suffered. And so, in verse 8, Jude says it's the same with those troublemakers that they're dealing with in, in this church. Notice his words, verse 8. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. So after bringing up those three notorious examples of disobedience and rebellion and, and immorality. In the previous three verses, Jude here says that these people that they're dealing with in the church are just like that. They're sinful. They are immoral re rebels who are on their way to an eternal punishment. And then, very quickly, Jude makes another list of three biblical bad examples that these false livers are like. In verse 11, notice, woe to them, he says, for they walked in the way of Cain. Remember Cain, the first murderer? And then he says, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. Balaam, you might remember, was a prophet but he was a prophet who was willing to sell truth for money. And he also led God's people into false worship. And then he goes on and says, And perished in Korah's rebellion. Now Korah led a rebellion against God's appointed leaders at the time, Moses and Aaron, when they were in the wilderness. And the earth opened up and and swallowed he and his whole clan, and they were destroyed as a result. So again, you see three more of the worst examples of sinners the Bible has to offer. And Jude says, this is what these people in the church who are troubling true believers were like. Now imagine listening to that sermon.
And then Jude goes on by inspiration in the following verses, verses 12 through 16, to really drive home his point. He continues to describe these people and continues to emphasize not only their sin, but, but the fact that they're right there in the midst of them, right there in the midst of the church. They're pretending to be real believers. They're proclaiming the name of Christ, and yet they're living the lifestyle of Satan. They're saying one thing and doing another. They're putting on an act. Well, the act is worn thin with Jude. He says they're not very good actors. And, and he can see right through them. So he calls them out and he names them by describing specifically how they live. And it's not a pretty picture at all. Again, it says they're rebellious, they, they blaspheme holy things, they're deeply immoral, grossly sexually immoral. In fact, if you look back at verse 7, there's a clear reference to specifically homosexual immorality. And so, in summary, it seems that what's being dealt with here is a group of religious pretenders who are deeply immoral and highly rebellious. And again, they're right there, smack dab in the middle of the church. And because of them, Jude says to the church, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. This faith has standards, you see. It has standards. It's not anything goes in the church. Uh, you know, just because we have a gracious and, and a merciful and a forgiving God does not mean that one can live any old way they want to live. God does not ignore Outright moral rebellion. God no longer winks at sin. There is a judgment to come. And it's sure. And it's thorough. No one has ever met anyone with higher standards than God. Now Jesus set the standard. He, he said... Be perfect. Can it get higher than that? The Lord Jesus Christ said, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the Spirit within us intends to change the way we live, the way we think, the way we act. He will not leave us be, you see. Don't ever be fooled into thinking otherwise. God expects us to live a certain way. He expects us to live right. Don't allow yourself to be lulled into thinking that the merciful God of heaven is just going to wave his hand over rebellious sin and say, that's okay, you all just come into heaven with me. I didn't really mean what I said when I said the wages of sin is death. So Jude finishes our text this morning, verses 20 through 23. And here he gives an exhortation and encouragement to the true Christians, to the real church. Hear what he says. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, 
hating even the garment stained by the flesh. This is true Christian living. This is what Jude would describe as, as what it's really about in the church. Contend for the faith when needed. Live lives of faith and love. Pray in the Spirit, which I, I think means pray according to the will of God. Pray in the will of God which assumes that one has been diligent to search out and find out what that will is. That's how you're able to pray in it. You have discovered what it is. You can't pray in the Spirit if you don't know what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit will never contradict himself. So again, don't fall prey and don't, don't listen to people that say, well, the Spirit told me it was okay to do this. The Spirit doesn't lie. He doesn't contradict himself. So if you're going to pray in the Spirit, you, you need to know what he wants. And then he says, to save those who falter. What we're talking about isn't never making a mistake. We, we all struggle and we falter at times. He says, save those who falter, have mercy on people who are struggling. There is a difference between people having some faith struggles, which we all have. There's a difference between that and outright rebellion. And, and so he encourages us to help those who are struggling. And then he says, do all you can to restore unfaithful rebellious brothers and sisters who are heading toward an eternal punishment. Jude is sort of an old-fashioned preacher, isn't he? But I'm not talking about old-fashioned in terms of 50 years ago or 100 years ago or even 150 years ago. I, I don't care about that. That's not what I mean. Jude is uh, a first century old fashioned preacher. He's biblical old fashioned. Jude speaks the words of the original faith to people who need to hear it. And sometimes what our modern culture, society, even our religious culture has offered to us about how to do church and, and how to be the church and even how to effectively reach out to people with the gospel. Sometimes what they've offered us is, frankly, a bunch of baloney. They have told us to soften the message. To not talk about certain issues and then to go easy on others. They have suggested that we should not expect human beings to be moral beings anymore. Not in this world, not in this culture. That's a lie. I especially resent it when our young people are taught that that they can't behave themselves, morally speaking. That is a lie. They're not animals. And they've said that the last thing we want to do is to judge anybody's lifestyle choices. And so they have con concocted sort of an anemic, empty, fruitless faith and demanded that we sign up and go along to get along. Jude calls that rebellion against God. Jude says it's desperately wicked and he says there's a judgment coming. But he also says that it's possible still even today to live faithful to God. 
It is possible to, to, to honestly strive to meet his standard, to be true spirit-filled Christians and to really love people at the same time. The choice is ours in how we will live our Christian life. I encourage you to think seriously about Jude's instruction. This morning we offer the invitation of Jesus to any here who might need to respond publicly, asking for the prayers of people who love you and care about you. We want to encourage you in your faith. We offer an invitation always open to any who need to come to Christ and to give their life to him and to obey his gospel. We would love to help you with that. And if you just have questions, if you need help in understanding and discerning God's will for your life, please know that there are always people here willing to help you. This morning, if you need to come before us, we give you this time to, to think about that and respond while we stand, while we sing this song.